So today I am um, I'm doing a little sort of casual questions thing, uh, uh, somewhat like um, the uh, well, exactly like the feature in Q magazine, I guess. Except there's no cash involved. Um, and you, Mr. Film Director, have asked me to um, post a Hotmail email site on my MySpace site. And so the people that come through my MySpace site are, have sent me a bunch of questions. And I've got no idea what the questions are, so I'm just going to have a look at them now. What kind of music bands were you listening to back in high school when you started Delarichi? I was listening to... Um, Back when I was in, I guess, fourth year at school, I was listening to The Fall, Joy Division. I, I really like Gang of Four. Uh, a lot of bands from Manchester. I love John Cooper Clark. Um, I really love the Buzzcocks. I was really obsessed with bands from Manchester for some reason. Uh, I was never that into The Clash or the, or the Jam or things like that. I just, I liked all those kind of bands that came out in 1978, 79 from Manchester. Um, and also, I suppose partly because nobody else at my school had heard of those bands, I could write them on my school bag, and that, that maybe I felt that gave me some kind of punk kudos or, or something. Because there were no punks at my school at all. There was one guy two years above me who, in like 1977, cut his hair short and looked, looked a wee bit punky. But he was like an art school punk, you know, he had, all, he had all the right clothes on, but he wasn't that into the music. Because I was the first guy at my school that really got into punk and post punk music. And there was one guy the year below me that turned up, <laughs> turned up in assembly. I went to this really posh school. We had morning assembly every, every morning. It was dead serious. Like you know, you had to, you know, if you talked and all that, you get chucked out. And um, well, maybe that's true of a lot of schools. I don't know. But uh, this guy the year below me turned up, and he was de a dead straight looking guy. And I didn't know he was into any sort of punk rock. But I suppose it shows you how incredibly populist punk rock got at one point. Uh, and it was after. Uh, Sid Vicious got arrested for murdering Nancy Spongeon and uh, he turned up with this massive badge on his lapel saying Sid is innocent and I just turned around and was like fuck's sake I thought it was the only guy in school that even knew Sid Vicious existed it was so completely bizarre but um so I was in all these things because I, I mean I, really, I loved them and I listened to John Peel every night I used to take every single John Peel show every night from 10 to 12 and uh, and then I would go through the tapes and then I would I would dub all the songs that I liked onto another tape, and so I've still got all these comp tape compilations of all these really obscure, obscure things you know that used to play. Tanguera. Well, I presume it's a girl. It might not be. <coughs> um, what path in life do you think you would have taken if you had not become a musician? That's a totally impossible question to answer, because it's like those. You know, there's, there's a really depressing thing about about genes, where you know, twins get separated at birth and one twin's brought up by a fireman in Ohio and the other twin's brought up by a, a pair of arts professors in Seattle and both twins end up becoming hairdressers. You know, it's... it's I mean, I think, there, I think there's a huge amount of predestination to, to people doing what they do. So I, I just can't answer the question. Sorry. If, I mean, if I... You know, if I didn't have, have a voice and, I'd, uh, and I didn't have any arms... I suppose I would have tried. To, I would have been some kind of writer. I would have tried to be to be a writer. I mean, how I would have made a living? I don't. I don't. I don't know. I mean, that's that's a. I'm, you know, you make a living by any means necessary. I, I find that really really difficult to answer because there's nothing. There's nothing else I would ever rather have done. Really, I mean, even when I was like seven, eight years old, when I lived down in Eng England, I used to sit and mime along to records on the piano and pretend I was on stage and all that. That was always my number one fantasy before playing football for Scotland or anything else or, or being Superman or whatever you know your whatever your sort of childhood fantasy is that was always the the, the main fantasy that I had. What world is your favourite place to perform? Uh, well the sort of joint favourites would be I mean just because the best shows that I've ever done have been in these places would be Sydney, Chicago and Glasgow Really, and I've, I've got a real fondness for Manchester and Liverpool. Liverpool's great, and, and, and Manchester can be really good as well. Do the venues count? 
The, the venues are everything. I mean, you can do, you can play the concert in Glasgow and you go, God, that was awful. Uh, even though it's a great audience, you just, it's awful. And then you, you play, I mean, play Barrowlands the next night and you go, fucking hell, that's great. Totally depends. And it's from Alice Mackay. Hi, Justin. Here are some questions for you. I hope they don't sound too pretentious or heavy, but when I read music bios, I like to find out about what goes on on inside the person's mind in relation to the music and the creative process. I would hate to hear you ask something as pointless as what flavoured crisps you liked, for instance. Although, that's a much easier question to, uh, to answer, what flavoured crisps you like. Um, thanks muchly, Alistair Mackay. So this is from Mike McLaughlin. JC, what's your favourite cheese? <laughs> you see, that's the first question that's made me laugh. Uh, my favourite cheese is just plain and simple, the round goat's milk cheese that you get. You get, you get it in the supermarket and you get nicer ones in cheese shots, but it's round and it's dead creamy and it's magic and you can cook with it and it's just absolutely brilliant. <laughs> this guy's a friend, of, a friend of mine on MySpace and I never actually realised the fuck I'm in the box. What's a, what's a pun on, on sodomy? Dear oh dear. Oh, that's, that's really tragic. It just shows you how innocent I am that I didn't actually realise that was... <laughs> Fuck, I'm into a pot. What a stupid name. Right, I want to know what piece of music gear you could not live without, and, well, at the moment it'd be that, that piano. And one, who would you give it to when you don't want to live <laughs> When you don't want to live anymore. That's quite good. Well, I would give it to my, uh, uh, I would give it to my girlfriend and her son because their piano's rubbish. Which group artist do you listen to now? I listen to Gillian Welsh, and I've been really enjoying King Creuso recently, and especially enjoying a guy called Alistair Roberts, who's a Scottish folky guy, who I think is kind of related to this fence collective mob from up in Anstruther. Hi, Justin. So here's a question. The song No Surrender, do you think that any record company would have the balls to release it? After all, it's not what you call PC. But it says a lot of what's really happening in the world today. Have you ever thought of going into politics? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fucking not. Oh, I know Biddy, she used to write to me. How fast do your sides grow and do they have any bearing at all on your songwriting capabilities? Uh, the longer they are, the better the songs. And as Jim Moyer, um, a.k.a. Vic Rees, once said to me, uh, he came up to me and said, what do your sides do? And I was like, what do you mean? Is that, mine, mine constantly encroach. <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant. And they do, they encroach. They never get shorter unless you make a, unless you make a concerted effort to chop into them and make them shorter. So they do, they just encroach, they just keep going. It must be, uh, it's, it's like um, Darwin's Tangled Bank. 